I'm really so glad to see this weather because when I left OR Tambo today, or not today, on I think it was last Saturday, I actually bought some long johns. So this is really nice to get this weather. It reminds me a lot of home. It's springtime in South Africa right now. So for the longest time, I've been second guessing my choice of media as my career path. It's not so much because I could have made a lot of money as an accountant, which I was actually studying um, when I was in varsity, but rather that because some of the primary social groups that I belong to, that is women, that is black, that is black women, are underrepresented in a number of fields, particularly those that are seen as more serious, those that involve the STEM subjects. So those are science, technology, engineering, mathematics. We're severely underrepresented in those fields. So I thought it's probably more important for me not to try and be another Oprah, but rather for me to go into those fields. The reason that I got into media in the first place was because in spite of my, you know, my efforts at being what you might call a conscious black person, which is to say someone who makes an effort to look beyond a Eurocentric and Western culture and looks towards an African history and culture, I still had what you might call stubbornly colonized thoughts. I asked myself what informed a lot of these thoughts that I had. Where did these messages keep coming into my mind from? And I came to understand over some time that an important part of colonialism and even apartheid in South Africa was the use of media to undermine African culture and paint it as inferior. The media in post-apartheid South Africa still plays a lot into some of these racial stereotypes. An example of evidence of this is a project or study that was done by the Media Monitoring Project which saw that or which found that a lot of racial stereotypes are still being played into such as that black people are criminals and that people act according to their ethnic identity. The reason we need to pay attention to this is because the media is unavoidable and because of this it means that it shapes a key role or plays a key role in how we shape and view our reality. While how other race groups view and treat black people as a result of these negative stereotypes is important, for me, I'm much more concerned about what this means for black people ourselves and how we view ourselves. In the words of early Pan-Africanist Marcus Garvey, you cannot grow beyond your thoughts. If your thoughts are those of a slave, you will remain a slave. So with this as the background, I began to think about what it is that I could do about the situation. I thought that I could use media as a force for counter stereotyping. I could use media for force to change mindsets. I came up with a two-pronged plan for my positive propaganda. The first part had to do with literature and the second part with mass media. The rationale for the split is that a vast majority of people are great consumers of mass media such as TV, magazines, t movies, and the like. A small minority are active readers within the world. When it comes to literature, the words of Toni Morrison are instructive. Is there's a book that you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet? Then you must be the one to write it. I personally found that there was too little African literature that didn't veer into what I call poverty porn. I also resented the other unspoken rule that Africans can't write literature for literature's sake. It has to be polemical or historical in nature. So, to remedy this, I've written the manuscript of my first novel called Sweet Medicine. It's the story of Tsitsi, a young woman who compromises the values of her religious upbringing to find both economic and romantic security through otherworldly means. After Tsitsi's father dies and his family appropriates their property, her mother, strict and devout, manages to rebuild their lives. This is an experience that never leaves Tsitsi, and it is one that plays out against the backdrop of 2008, which is the height of Zimbabwe's economic crisis. The way I see it is that if Stephen King's 30 book rejections and J.K. Rowling's 12 rejections are anything to go by, I'm in the process of building my street cred. I'm pretty sure that with five rejections dialed, I think I'm about 12 rejections until my international book and film deal. That said, if you know any publishers, call me. 
In future, I do have the hopes of starting an African media and publishing house to rival the likes of Penguin Random House. When it comes to mass media, the dilemma that I was facing was that I'm a lover of magazines, but I wasn't finding what reflected my experiences on the newsstands. On the one hand, what I found is that within the traditionally black magazines, they didn't quite reflect my experiences because they tended to be focused on old women, such as my mother. On the other hand, I, I took exception to being treated as a special interest group in what are seen as the more multiracial magazines in South Africa. I found that my interests and experience were often reported upon in narrow and unnuanced ways, often quite anthropological. An example of, of that is often when looking at the makeup section, you would find that there'd be about 10 different shades for white women. So that's, you know, tan, rose, go, olive, golden. And then for black women, that was me, Aliquik, Beyonce, all had to use deep. The same sort of thing applied to hair and many other non-beauty related products or, or related topics. What I wanted from my media was content that engaged me as the default. I figured that I wasn't alone in this design, that there must be a whole lot of other people with similar experiences to mine. This community of women I call code switchers. Code switchers are part of the burgeoning black middle class in post-apartheid South Africa and grappling with issues particularly related to culture and identity as our 20-year-old democracy build, continues on its nation-building project. Code switchers are part of the Virgin Mac middle class and have likely had a multiracial schooling experience that in South Africa often means an assimilation into white culture. So for many of us, the kind of terms that have been thrown at us are coconut, Oreo, and whatever other inside out black person metaphor you can think of, we've heard it. Funny enough, the other day I was speaking on radio and during a break, a listener tweeted a message to the show's host and he said, oh my gosh, the coconutness in that studio, you really need to bottle it up and sell it. I've heard this many, many times. So I just laughed and I asked if the show host could please repeat it on air. He did and I told the listener that I was really, really glad that he was reaching out and asked if he could please send me his details because I really would like to send this to market. I'd been thinking of this for such a long time now. For many women like me, there's a lot of code switching that happens between a number of culturally diverse environments such as our family homes, communities, schools and offices. An example of the kind of things that we deal with is that in Southern Africa, we, what we refer to as lobola, which is the traditional practice of a diary which is given by a man to the family of his wife. In fact, about a month ago, I told my boyfriend that I would like to start paying or start doing lobola negotiations very seriously. We've been together for about two and a half years now, so I think it's quite reasonable because if he's not interested, then I'm out. While it tends to be seen as quite a sexist act in Western culture, I, as a self-identifying feminist, am quite in favor of Lobola. Because I believe if certain aspects are changed or modified, it can be quite beneficial. These aspects include the end of excessive charging and allowing the woman to also contribute to the payment. This is particularly because in African culture, we see that the wedding is not just a one-day event. It is something that's meant to bring two families as opposed to two people together. This is similar in what we see in Greek and Indian cultures. Another example is the fact that in traditional African culture, we're taught to be deferent and respectful to those older than us. I'm told that this is quite similar in Austrian culture. Part of what that means is that we're not meant to talk back or refer to any adult by their first name. So it must be Uncle Gerfried, or it must be Auntie Katerina, Mr. Stocker, and Miss Binet, and so on. Contrast this to the office, which is predominantly Western, and that means it's now Gerfried and Katerina. The sort of difference to those older than you won't get you far up the corporate ladder. And as I found in my experience, I was often told that I'm not confident enough and I don't speak with enough authority when I'm referring to those older than me. We code switches are full of real and seeming contradictions. This morning when I got dressed up in my African attire, I was playing gangster rap. When I go out, it sometimes involves twerking with my friends and maybe even for my boyfriend. When I was in the airport lounge, I got bored, so I spent the time online clicking through pictures of Kim Kardashian-style revolution since Kanye West. When I got into a plane, I was reading Time magazine. 
Naturally, the experience of code switching is not something that's unique to young black women. However, in South Africa and many other global, global contexts, it's something that's quite pronounced for us. Above all, I and many other code switchers wanted a space where our voices could be heard and where we could hear each other. Very often, when you're dealing with issues, it's not so much that you want to get the answer, but rather that you want to hear someone else say, me too. Having worked in the media, both on the corporate side and as a journalist, I understand that the corporate structures are ultimately what affect the content that gets to be put out. I'm someone who believes in having a sense of agency, so after some time, I grew quite tired of complaining about these structures. After all, power is taken, it's not given. So I thought, I need to create the magazine that me and my friends want to read. I figured that if I were a big, mag or big media house, I probably wouldn't fund a 22-year-old print magazine idea. So I thought the way that I need to convince them is by first proving that there's a demand for the content that I wanted to produce. Using the bird in the hand principle, I decided that I could make the money to start an online platform and eventually grow this into a big multimedia company using the principles of the lean startup and customer centricity. At the beginning of the year, while I still had my corporate job, I began to prepare for my leap into entrepreneurship, and part of that meant living on half of my salary. Starting something and having the conviction to see your ideas and through is one of the most difficult parts of entrepreneurship. In my hand here, is actually the paper that I first drew the idea for my magazine. I did this when my parents were actually at a car dealership and I was sitting in the car and writing this down. So this is where it started. And I remember showing my mother the site when it was still under construction and she sort of just rolled her eyes because she'd seen me trying to do so many things so many times. So, you know, she just dismissed this. And when I approached a number of other people, they sort of just said, yeah, great, you know, they'd say, sure, I'll write for you, I'll take pictures for you, but, you know, nothing ever materialized. Perseverance and single-mindedness are so important in achieving a vision. You'll find that if you take the bold leap and lead, others will, le others will soon join where you follow, or will, others will soon follow. Vanguardmagazine.co.za was launched on the 29th of April, 2014. It serves to provide a space where code switchers are the default and can engage with content that reflects their experiences. Our editorial pillars include articles, opinions, fashion, and culture. We call the style fast casual, which means that they're long enough to give you depth, but short enough that you can read while, re while in a queue or in between a meeting. Here are the titles of some of our most, most popular articles. Letter to my sister 64 days later, a tribute to the missing Nigerian girls. What the hell is a fashion blogger anyway? Of angels and ancestors, exploring traditional belief systems and Christianity in the 21st century. The Pussy Palace, women taking control of their sexuality. The finances of shacking up without breaking up. Un-African Africans, the experience of being homosexual in Africa. This hip hop ain't loyal, why isn't hip-hop down for women? Have you checked your privilege lately? Exploring identity, relativity, and privilege. The mainstream media in South Africa has been very receptive to Vanguard. Both local and national, radio and TV have hosted us. We often get to have radio slots where we discuss articles of the week and get to hear in real time how our code switches react to the perspectives that we publish. It's a great way to reach new audiences and to give new dimensions to our content. New media is not only about the online space, it's ultimately about creating an all-encompassing experience where content is at the center of different distribution mediums. In the so-called offline space, we have a regular column in the, in the national newspaper, and we're soon going to begin offering events through where our code switches can create an imp important social networks and professional and professional networks with each other. The last seven months working on Vanguard has been an experience I couldn't prepare for. Firstly, the hardest part about entrepreneurship is the emotional roller coaster. Sometimes my business partner and I think, oh my gosh, this is so amazing, how did we think about this? Other times, we just want to crawl up and die. The excitement that you get when thinking about that, the fact that you can wake up at any time when you, that you want to, quickly dies when you realize that your paycheck isn't guaranteed anymore. 
The most important, or rather the other aspect that's also very difficult, is that the reaction to the nature and positioning of our magazines can sometimes be antagonistic or it can be very encouraging. The thing about being in the public eye is that anyone and everyone has an opinion about you and they're going to tell you about it. The most important feedback has of course come from our readers, the code switchers. It's been very, very encouraging. Often we get responses such as, thank you for saying that, or I've been thinking about that forever but I didn't have the words. In fact, this morning I got a tweet that said, and I was really, really happy to see this. It was from a young man who is at Rafiwa Maneta, and he says, P.S., this is just a random tweet, follow at Ms. Vanguard if you haven't. Fucking awesome work that they do. Outside of that, questions that we often field are along the lines of, why do you code switches need your own space? Why not include everyone? Why do you need to focus on just women? Why do you insist on focusing on your blackness? Why do you have to focus on black women specifically? To this, I often say I'm a big fan of titles such as Vanity Fair, The New Yorker, even GQ. I'm pretty sure that I, as a young African woman, am not part of their target market, but I'm still able to engage with and enjoy content that doesn't centralize my experiences. We find that we achieve a greater degree of universality by being specific to our context. Beyond the questions around our choice of demographic, I find myself challenged in ways that I haven't been before. My mind has increasingly become a contested space as we explore complex matters with our readers. Many of my assumptions and beliefs that I've held to be true for many years have either been completely obliterated, reinforced, and sometimes I've just been left confused. What our Vanguard experience points to so far is that you don't necessarily need the answers. I've learned to interrogate questions about my identity and my place in society in ways that have made me extremely uncomfortable. For example, examining the role that I play in society by virtue of the fact that I'm middle class, I'm heterosexual, that I'm a cisgender woman, and that I'm able-bodied amongst many other things. The experience we've had with the magazine shows us that people love content that is nuanced, that is local, and reflects their experiences. You no longer need the traditional gatekeepers to get to the audience that you want to. We are an upstart of a startup and like to think of ourselves as Davids against the Goliaths, up against big and established media houses with huge resources. This understanding of the code switcher market, because we are the code switchers ourselves, is our biggest advantage. Along this journey, a turning point has come in terms of my complex about my unserious career choice. Two weeks ago, a couple days of before my 23rd birthday, that complex changed when I saw the media coverage around the murder of Mike Brown in the USA and in South Africa, the media coverage of the two-year anniversary of the massacre of the more than, 34 mine, more than 30 mine workers at the Marikana mines. What got my attention was the differences that we saw between what mainstream media reported versus what was seen in independent and social media. These alternative sources of media humanized and made their stories real to me. The stories were no longer about body counts, but rather about real human beings. I've heard it said time and time again, there's no such thing as objective reporting, only perspectives. One of the aspects that I take most pride in is that by being a co-owner and editor of my own platform, I have the discretion on the various slants that we take on stories, what we choose to highlight, what we choose to omit. Those decisions are made every day in every media house and have real impacts on the story's meanings. Here are some of the choices that we at Vanguard get to make. We make it a point to use person-first language, so it's not gays, retards, and Jews, it is instead gay people, retarded people, Jewish people. You won't find us justifying the need to empower a woman by virtue of the fact that she's a sister, mother, wife, or any other relationship. 
we need to know that she deserved the respect just as a result of her personhood, and that's it. Nor will you find us justifying the injustice of an unarmed man being killed by virtue of the fact that he went to college. Saint or not, his life was lost. I sometimes take this for granted, but it really is a privilege that we are part of a new generation that are becoming the gatekeepers of our own realities. I've never believed more in how important that is than I do right now. With a strong sense of pride, I now take ownership of the path that I've chosen. The power of media to give a voice to those of us who have had our experience marginalized is invaluable. Media in the hands of those who are deliberate can be a serious weapon for change. Thank you.